Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the fifth annual Deep Valley Book Festival. Uh, thank you for joining us today for Behind the Scenes, the fiction writer panel discussion. This discussion was pre-recorded, so you can stream it in the safety and comfort of your own home. Uh, we appreciate you helping us to make this book festival a success despite the pandemic. My name is Chelsea Farr, and I'm the editor-in-chief for Fox Point Publishing. We're joined today by five fiction writers to discuss their approaches to and experiences with writing. I'll start by introducing our panelists and then we'll launch right into our Q&A session. If you have any follow-up questions for any of the writers, you'll be able to find their contact information on their respective author pages on the Deep Valley Book Festival website. So first up, uh, we have Sarah Byron. Uh, she is the young adult author of the Last Thing You Said and Cold Day in the Sun, both of which take place in a fictionalized lake town in the Brainerd, Minnesota area. She has an MFA in Creative Writing from Minnesota State University in Mankato. She recently moved to Wisconsin with her husband and their two teenagers. Next up is Raven Ekman. She is a dark fantasy writer and a freelance editor from Pennsylvania. She obtained her BA in English with a concentration in creative writing from Arcadia University. Her debut novel, Shadow Speak, will be published by Fox Point Publishing in early 2021. Kirsten Hall, over here, is the writer of five books with four more in the works for 2020 and 2021. Uh, because of her varied interests, she writes in several different genres and for all age groups. Kirsten's also had a long career in sales, presenting, and publishing. She lives in Minnesota with her two youngest sons. Uh, Lydia Emma Niebuhr published the first of 11 books for middle grade readers in 2010. These were followed with one historical fiction before writing to the cozy mystery genre. The fourth mystery is being written for the Tad Wheeler series. She and her husband live on a farm near Corning, Minnesota. And then finally, we have uh, Susan Stradiato. She's the author of three fantasy novellas, a fantasy short story, a romance novel, and two romance novelettes. She has three romance novels in production under the pen name Julia O'Green, and she will be releasing a fantasy series involving dragons in 2021. She lives in Minnesota with her spouse, their three children, and two fur babies. All right, so now you know all of our panelists here. Uh, so to kind of open up the floor, we'll start uh, with Sarah and just kind of go down the line in the order I introduced you guys in. Do you remember uh, when and why you first thought about becoming an author? And if you could give yourself, uh, your younger self, writing advice, what would it be? Well, I started writing at a pretty young age. Um, in my elementary school, we had writers in residence who came in and taught us um, different po you know, poetry and short stories and that sort of thing. So I started writing <clears throat> at a pretty young age, I would say about third grade. And then as I moved through junior high and high school, I um, continued to take classes mainly through Compass um, out of St. Paul. And then when I was in college, I also um, focused my English degree on creative writing and subsequently um, obtained my MFA from Mankato State University. It was still known, I believe, as Mankato State University at that time. So um, if I could give my younger self any advice, it would be oh, to not waste so much time. Um, because I, I have a lot of interests and so I did a lot of other things as well. And um, so I had this uh, long, very long career in retail management and I got interested in human resources and a lot of other things and marketing. Um, and so I would say, just focus on one thing <laughs> and don't wait too long. All right, and next up we have Raven. Um, so I actually started writing after I read Twilight and I decided I wanted to do a werewolf story. Like I didn't want vampires, but I wanted some werewolves. 
so I started there and it was kind of like the short novellas. I wasn't really sure exactly what I was doing because I just completely branching off into something different for me. And then I actually practiced writing when I got into fan fiction. So it just kind of like completely went with it with like characters that I loved. And it really kind of helped me decide like what perspectives I liked and what kind of genres then and everything like that. Uh, in terms of writing advice for my younger self and even myself now is don't let the bad days win. So if you're writing and like a writer's block or you just kind of can't connect with a character, just don't stop because I actually ended up stopping after uh, when I graduated and it took me about four years to finally then get back in and kind of finally find myself again as a writer. That's good advice. And uh, next up we have Kirsten Hall. I just want to apologize in advance. My internet connection's a little spotty. So bear with me here. Okay. Well, my adventure into books started when I was very young, um, three, four. My mom has a ton of books. And um, she also used to be a part of the book of the month club. I don't know Ray and Chelsea wouldn't remember these, but do you guys remember those book of the month club with the little catalogs that came in the, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Exactly. Yeah. My mom would look through them and she would order her books and then she'd give me the catalog and I'd go scurrying off into my room and I'd make intense lists of everything I wanted. Not that I got them, but I made lists. So occasionally I would get one book and that was pretty neat. The one thing I would tell my younger self is um, start sooner. Don't listen to the naysayers, and it does not matter what your family, your friends, your extended relatives, or what the people at church think. Just, I listened to so many people who told me, oh, you shouldn't do that, that's not a real job, or whatever the case may be, or, or it's not good enough, or whatever. And um, don't, don't listen to other people. If you know you can do it, just go out and do it. There you go. That's right. my advice. <laughs> Thank you. And um, that is good advice. Uh, next up, we have Lydia Emma Niebuhr. Well, I think I entered my first writing contest when I was in high school. And it was very, very bad. I'm, I know. But um, I didn't have a lot of encouragement to do writing. Uh, I went to a small school, uh, didn't have time for a lot of other than essential subjects. Um, but my other love was science, and I thought science would be better because I could at least make a living with it. <laughs> I wasn't sure I could as a writer. Um, and I went to way back when it was Mankato State College. Now I'm really dating myself. <laughs> but uh, and and after, but I did start writing um, even while I was a chemist. That's what my degree was in. I had my master's in chemistry, so this writing now in this cozy mystery series is a, a stretch for me because I'm going from scientific facts kind of writing to something that's more, um, you have more input as far feelings and stuff. And so I'm learning that and I'm getting a lot of help from Raven, which I really appreciate. But the thing is that if I were going to talk to myself now, I would say, don't give it up, keep going with it even while you're in college. Um, although I didn't really have a lot of time in college, but all those years when I was working, um, there were times, and, and uh, some of you know that one of my first, well, my very first book was written in one of the plants in a cold room, sitting, sitting on a pallet. So uh, I just finally took it up. And, uh, but just, I would have told myself earlier on, don't give up, don't listen to everybody, like you said, you know. So that that's, would be my advice to me. All right, good. And um, next we have Susan. Hi. So um, as far as when I started writing, uh, I normally say that I started in 2017. That's when I got extremely serious about wanting to get my work out there. Um, I, I started because I needed a diversion. Uh, my son was we were butting heads a little bit when he was in school because he didn't want me to manage his time. And I had historically managed my older two children's time pretty strictly as I'm by trade a project manager. 
Uh, so I had to put that energy somewhere else and I put it into my fantasy world, Keitera, which uh, his, I've released three novellas and I actually do have another, a novel coming out um, in 2020 in that world as well, following the novellas. Um, and so, so that was really my push into wanting to do more full-time writing. I have, like everybody else on this panel, I think written since I was knee-high to a grasshopper. So let's talk about style. Uh, let's say you could talk to somebody um, anonymously uh, about your, your own work. How would you describe your writing style to this other person? And we will start with Sarah. Yeah, this was a hard question for me because um, I, I really had to think about it. But um, I, I write from usually from a first person um, present tense. So um, it, I'm kind of in the moment and I try to really get into um, the heads of my characters and how they would speak so my character uh, my writing is how my characters would speak and so when i went to graduate school i was not writing young adult fiction i was writing um, short stories literary short stories and one of my professors there terry davis um, had read one of my stories and said you know have you ever tried writing for uh, young adult fiction because i really think you have the voice for it and i had not and I resisted it actually for several years. Um, and I was out of school probably about three years before I um, started reading more young adult fiction again and um, tried my hand at it and I really loved it. So I feel like it's, I try to um, really get into the heads of my characters and then um, my writing style is how they would how you know 16 17 year old would speak um so it's pretty varied my sentence structure is very some are really short and really basic and some are um you know more lyrical or um, i have a tendency to write these sort of one sentence paragraphs which get edited out a lot <laughs> So um, I even have in my first book, the last thing you said, I even have a one sentence chapter, which um, didn't get edited out, which that's my favorite chapter. I love it. <laughs> it was the easiest to write. No, just Hard and sweet. <laughs> All right. Um, Raven, how about you? Uh, well, I definitely had trouble with this question because at first I wasn't sure exactly what was supposed to be the answer because originally when I was kind of mentally thinking about it, I'm like winging it does that count as like a writing style like I wasn't sure like drafting winging it just seeing what happens um, and then the more I thought about it I'm definitely a first person narrative and I, I've tried present tense so it's like a weird flip-flop between like it had happened so past and present kind of thing uh, when I actually first was writing I had never done and greatly disliked first person so I don't know if it was just more of a connectivity thing for myself or it was kind of removing myself from the scene that helped me to write it again at first. But now I just love um, the emotional connection and the like further exploration of, okay, so you have your character, but like how would you react, but then how would they react kind of thing. Um, I love a good angst scene. So I don't know what that says about me as a person, but like, I like some angst. So uh, writing in first person also kind of like brings that out a little bit more of like how it connects on a different level and how it could connect. Uh, so, I mean, we're like, we're winging it plus first person, plus it's a little darker. So we're just kind of seeing what happens. Nice. Um, all right. So next, Kirsten, what do you, um, what do you have to say about this? Well, um, basically, of my two fiction books that so far, um, they're very dialogue driven. Lots of dialogue. Well, it takes place in the back corner of a coffee shop between two people chit chatting. So very dialogue driven. But um, the short story that I contributed to the Cook to Death series, uh, volume four, Cold Cuts, basically, it's a um, anthology of murders that come with recipes. So that's a 
is fun, but it, it works and it's a really fun series. That one was mostly internal thoughts, motivation and resolution, which was a nice change for me from the dialogue driven manuscript. Kind of one extreme to the next, huh? Yeah, there's no middle ground with me. <laughs> it's either black or white. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lydia, how, how would you describe your writing to someone else uh, anonymously? Well, I, I think mine is sort of a, right now, a crossing over from my scientific writing, which is there's never an I or me or you in anything you report. It's just the facts. And so it's descriptive. You describe what you've done and results. So now um, I'm learning to put in more dialogue. And I'm finding I, I like to do that. I, I'm getting more and more of it in. Um, and, and, and I like it. But it's, uh, it's, been, a, it's been a challenge. I, I mean, I thought I was doing, I thought I had it okay until I learned <laughs> through editing that um, it, it needed more. It, and, and, I, and I have one sentence paragraphs too because that's what was suggested in in the manuscript so I'd go with it i mean i that's because i don't have i don't even have an english kind of major um you know <laughs> it teaches how to write anything but facts when you're in biology and chemistry and mathematics so you know it's 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 a transition it's it's a big transition and i'm hoping i'm, I'm moving in the right direction to be more descriptive than factual in a lot of this stuff but there's you know i mean descriptive in the fact that i'm adding conversation to add to the scene rather than facts to add to the scene nice and it, and it sounds like you're liking it so far oh i'm loving it <laughs> and you know don't worry I, anybody everyone needs an editor a second third fourth pair of eyes <laughs> absolutely um, yeah, Susan, what do you what do you have to say about this topic here? So, in my fantasy, I like to describe it as visual, sensory, and evocative. And what I mean like by that is whether it be first or third person, it's usually a close point of view. And it's it's walking with one character at a time. So when I write, I strive to embed a lot of, you know, well, this is kind of what the character is thinking uh, at the time, but I don't always give exactly how they're feeling because I kind of want their actions and their, their more logical thoughts to allude to those feelings because I want the reader and this is this is challenging the reader i want the reader to step back and say if i were in this situation how would i feel so i want to drive those feelings from the bottom up with the rest of the story the rest of the language structure all and the the scenery so for example something that i would tend to do is if i'm writing a scene in a restaurant and there's tension between um, two of the characters. I might have a plate dropped in the background and crash. So just something to hint that there should be more underneath, but not necessarily put that in black and white on the page. So that's what that's kind of where I strive to write in my fantasy. When I when I switch over to my contemporary, I am very short to the point. Uh, I, I I make it very crisp um, because I want that story to move. Those that I think my readers, when they in, end up reading a contemporary novel, um, I think they're looking to plow through those novels. It's not a literary fiction, it's contemporary romance or contemporary uh, current fiction. So um, they, I've seen many of those readers that are putting out three books a week as far as reading goes, and they're looking to drive through it. So I want to keep that, that prose a little more snappy and a little more witty and moving, moving through to the plowing through that story. Every scene needs to have a point that's going to drive that story toward the end, the end goal. All right. Um, yeah, it seems like we got some good advice out of this this question. Um, a lot of different responses. Um, it, it kind of 
goes into the next question pretty well if if any of you have any writing quirks um either things that that stay in the final version or things that end up getting edited out maybe um phrases that you use a lot or um you know anything like that we'll we'll start again with sarah I, I mentioned one of my quirks, which is the one sentence paragraph, which um, sometimes my agent for sure is like, you need to hold on to these so that they really come and have the impact that you want them to. So don't overuse them. Um, and so sometimes before it even gets to my editor, my agent and I have kind of worked through and worked out some of those um, so that there aren't as many. Um, I would say otherwise, I have a lot of uh, I have a lot of crutch words, I guess, I or words that I overuse, and one of those is just. And so, um, ever, before I send it to anyone, I do find and see how, exactly how I've used. Um, <laughs> and then try to work through some of those and get rid of those. Um, otherwise, I with my first book, I wrote um, dual POV, um, a male and a female character. And when that book was done, I swore I would never do it again. And my second book was just one POV. And now this, uh, I have another uh, book that I'm working on that comes out next fall. And that is dual POV. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. How the story came about, right? <laughs> That's right. All right. Um, yeah, and that control find can be really, really valuable tool. Um, all right. Next up, Raven. Well, so I said about writing in first uh, person, so first person point of view and everything like that. So I definitely notice when I'm first writing and kind of drafting, however it happens, I use I, just I a lot. Like I did this, I did that, and then. You don't really, I think, realize how much, at least went for a first person perspective, that you're using it until you go back and start reading it to yourself. And like everything, even like every new paragraph or however you're looking at it is I. And you're just, wow, I'm just using this word a lot. Like I didn't bear any of the sentences. It's just I. And then I'm also notorious, regardless of what draft I'm on for switching tenses. And I hadn't figured out why. I don't know if it's in my head because I'm playing it out that I think it should be first person. But then my brain's like, no, you must switch it to past. And then so it becomes a past tense. But it, both of those are just notorious. So before anybody even sees it, at least definitely for like the first few drafts, it, I got to take out all those eyes. And then afterwards, tenses wise, it just kind of, hopefully whatever happens is what tense it just like picked and go from there. Tense, okay. tense swapping. It can get tricky. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Chelsea. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm her editor, so yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> My bad. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Everyone needs an editor. Um, all right, Kirsten, you're up next. All right. Well, Chelsea is also my editor. And I have been, she has, okay, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been told that I don't put enough, if any at all, of character descriptions into my story. I figure with enough of the inner monologue and the external dialogue, people will get to, you know, they'll put together what the character descriptions look like. I mean, to put in what the color of a sweater is, or they were, you know, average height or medium build, or they were wearing a hat, I could care less. Chelsea, on the other hand, We've gone round with this. And it's, it's um, part so, of your style now. Yeah. See, it, to me, all of that's just filler. I mean, between what's talked about and what's happening and the, the different, anywho. So I need to work on that. Um, I will point out, though, that I've had several readers, bookstore owners, librarians, et cetera, read my books. And they all said that right off the bat, there were no character descriptions or very little descriptions, but they said, but from the story and what was said and divulged, et cetera, they were able to put whatever their character wanted to look like, or they already knew someone like that in their heads and they really enjoyed the story. 
So I'm just saying. <laughs> but yeah, that's my quirk. That's my one thing that um, Chelsea and I have gone around on because I, I really don't care if the person's wearing a hat or they have brown hair. I, you know, that has nothing to do with the story. I'm, you know, just the facts, you know, and, and I that's pop it along. Funny. But I go, I'm almost the opposite. Yeah. Um, and I, in my current work, I'm trying really hard to be very minimalistic on that. Um, and just let it, let it come through, through other, other subtleties. But on my first books, I was very descriptive. So that's an interesting, interesting difference in styles. Well, yeah. Chelsea would like what you write because she, <laughs> she gets after you know, me on what I write. It's been a while since I've edited your stuff. Um, Olivia, what, what writing quirks do you, do you have? Do you know? Well, I don't know about quirks, but one of the things I like to do is, especially in the, the middle grade reader books, have the reader identify the speaker by what he says. In one of the books, the character always says, the same thing like absolutely or precisely. And so you never had to say, well, Edward said that because everybody knows that's Edward's word. So I, I've used that a lot in, in the middle grade readers, but now in the, the first of the, the um, cozy mysteries, uh, a guy is identified because he wears a hat. <laughs> and I don't, you know, I don't, I didn't describe a lot of them to begin with, but description of some of the characters um, as being scruffy or, you know, whatever, comes from, from the observation of people around him. So um, I think that, that, I don't know that I have any, maybe more than maybe three in that whole book that is actually a paragraph that said, this is so-and-so and this is what he looks like and blah, blah. I don't think I do. I think they're, they're all just other people describe them and that's kind of the way I kind of like it but uh you know that may change <laughs> I'm still evolving here you know <laughs> into a, something other than a scientific writer of <laughs> facts and figures yeah always evolving that's good um Susan how about you do you have any quirks I am a language nerd so I, I tend to go in my fantasy work, especially I tend to go a little overboard there that I, and I've had to pull back on quite a bit of my, my language building, uh, so that people can understand it a little better. I've learned a lot about how to, um, hint at what a word meaning is outside of dialogue while they use the, um, the language that they're, they're dealing with inside of dialogue. Uh, and then I've done a lot of just straight cutting words out that really people don't need to see. So that that's, I think it's more of a fantasy genre type quirk. Uh, but along with that, I also have a thing for names. And almost all of my names have some kind of meaning. Not all of them, but most of them do. Um, an example that my very first editor caught me on is my main character in the Kateran Tales. Uh, her, she had a cat at the beginning of the, uh, at the beginning of the story before she went through a portal behind me, portal. Uh, <laughs> and she named it Sam the Siamese. And every single time I referred to that cat, I called it Sam the Siamese. And I would do that with my pets too. Like I have Knox the Docks, my little mini dachshund, my winter dog. Um, and I talk about him as Knox the Docks. Uh, so she hated it. My editor absolutely hated it. And I, I, do, I do that repetitively. And I've had people tell me that some of the names that I choose are um, hard on the tongue or hard to relate to. Uh, because, and it's not necessarily all in the fantasy genre. Um, one of the, one of my contemporary romance novels, I used, um, the name Celt, C-E-L-T. Uh, and it's, it, in Celtic, it can pr be pronounced Celtic or Celtic. And I pronounce it Celt. It doesn't really matter. You could say Celt if you want to. But I had a couple people get really hung up on that. 
Um, but it's, it was intended to give his background of being Irish. And the, I mean, the female character in that, his sister is, her name is Boo, and that's short for Boudicca, who is one of the Irish war heroes, female Irish war heroes from way back when. So I, a lot of times people get hung up on some of those because they don't really, they aren't, they're sensing something, I think, but they're not really um, grasping the full meaning. So usually throughout the story, I'll tell you at some point, but uh, that one, that can be a hang up, especially for critiquers, not necessarily for editors. The quirks like Sam the Siamese, the, those get edited out. But uh, What sorts of scenes are easiest for you to write and uh, what ones are the hardest that maybe inspire some of that writing block that you talked about earlier? But we'll start again with Sarah. Uh, I think the easiest scenes for me are the scenes where characters are arguing. <laughs> um, I Dialogue comes pretty naturally for me. And so, um, like I said before, I like scenes that have a little bit of tension in them. Also, um, the more romantic scenes are easier to write. Um, I would say the hardest scenes to write are the ones that stem from some sort of personal experience. So uh, with my first book, The Last Thing You Said, um, it is about two characters who are dealing with a shared grief. And so while I was writing that book, I uh, went back to my journals from high school, um, which is, you know, fun in itself. But um, I had a friend who died when we were juniors. And so going back and reading uh, some of those journal entries and the newspaper articles and that sort of thing. So um, really kind of digging in to those scenes and feeling the character's grief, which was so, you know, similar to mine. Those were difficult. Um, in my second book, uh, the character um, experiences some different pressures and anxieties. And it's interesting because any time that I was working on some of those scenes with her anxiety, I like my leg would be bouncing up and down where I was like physically feeling what she was feeling. Um, and so I think that some of those scenes are a little bit um, harder to write and more easily avoided. Um, I tend to procrastinate on some of those. So the ones that hit too close to home. Yes, exactly. Um, Breathen, how about you? I would actually say the ones that hit too close to home, I find are actually the easiest ones to write. And I think it's more of, in my head, kind of like an anxiety, like kind of like, I guess it just stems from like a personal experience. So kind of like, I know maybe what the character is going through, or I can kind of relate enough to it. So a lot of the scenes for me were like, it's kind of like an er internal reflection or um, kind of maybe an angst or a romance like anything like that it kind of depends on what the mood's being set but normally I'm okay with it the harder ones I actually find are writing are fight scenes which I guess could be the dynamics of everything so like who's doing this and then like what happens if like a character like falls to the ground like do I remember them a little bit later like or um where there's multiple characters, so maybe not fight scene per se, but if there's multiple characters, even if they're not the main character, so you have like five characters, they're all sitting around like playing a game or something, and then you kind of get into your main character and like the scene's playing out, but then you totally forgot about at least one of the other characters. Like they sat down and then they just didn't say absolutely anything, like the entire two scenes, and you're kind of like, did I have them get up? Did I remember them at all? Like they just literally sat there and were kind of like, it's okay, guys, you keep going without me. So I guess multiple people is kind of hard, as well as like the fight scenes in terms of when everything's going, like, did I block my face or did they want to do that? Let's see how it goes. Yeah, kind of the ones that are maybe more technically difficult. Yeah, like a technical <laughs> versus, yeah, like, okay, they're bleeding from like a cut on their face, but they can magically see everything that happens and like the arrow that's coming towards them from like 20 yards. Somehow they're kind of like, Oh no, I got this. I can dodge rather than they're <laughs> like hurt. <Kinda. laughs> um, 
Yeah, everyone's everyone's got their uh, technical difficulties. Uh, Kirsten, how about you? All right, uh, scenes that are easiest for me to write: um, awkward, dry comedy, and uncomfortable scenes of mental turmoil and anguish. So you know, good fun. Uh, basically, <laughs> uh, dark, evil, sadistic, uh, taking people to a dark place without them com completely comprehending the direction they're traveling. But I make it interesting. You know, the kind where you can take pictures along the way and think you're having fun. The things that are hardest for me to write though, I will never write a romance novel. Just not my gig. Um, in Corner Confessions, um, a hint of a romantic relationship peaked. And I had readers that were like, oh, this is cool. I wonder where this is going to go. Um, I got rid of that hassle by the second book. Um, had nothing to do with anything. Um, life is not always a bowl of cherries. I mean, it's not always a happy Hollywood ending. I mean, sometimes it just, you know, there it is. And you make peace with it and you walk away. There, there's good and there's bad and there's, oh my gosh, and there's, I mean, it's just a hodgepodge of different things. Yeah. Um, you know, everyday life is really what it is, you know? Hodgepodge, huh? Yeah. <laughs> just remember, I'm quirky and go with it. <laughs> I can attest to that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. Um, Lydia, how, how about you? Are there some scenes that are, are easier for you to write? Well, I like writing descriptive scenes where the main character, he's not with anybody or she's not with anybody to talk to, so you don't have dialogue, but try to build some suspense or something around that character. I like to do those kind of scenes. Um, but the one, and then, you know, by the same token, the ones that are the hardest, are obviously, are the extreme violent ones and... and sexually graphic ones. I can't do those, but I think that, um, and, and the other thing I like to do, I like to write scenes that will lead you up to a point and drop you, you know, you now you think this is, this is the guy that's guilty. And then all of a sudden you've got somebody else that's possibly guilty and try and put a few more twists and turns before the book ends. I like to do that. That's. Yes, she does. <laughs> I can attest to that being like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see that coming. Didn't, yeah, exactly. My comment um, would be, what? <laughs> Susan, how about you? What what kind of scenes are easiest to write, that you like to write, and, and what are the more difficult ones? So my favorite kind of scenes to write are anything that are descriptive, that are descriptive and sensory. So I actually like writing sex scenes <laughs> because they are very tactile um, and, and there's lots of emotion plus physical feeling at the same time. So I, I enjoy driving characters into new situations where they haven't been before so that you then can explore how that pushes them and drives them in different directions. Um, the new connect, I'm a romance writer, so the new connection between the people, you know, kissing scenes or writing that first kiss scene in the book is my favorite, absolutely my favorite. Um, and then as far as fantasy goes, you get that in a different way because they're exploring different parts of this world that you're building and you're introducing the readers to. So anything that, that's really dealing with everything that they see, hear, feel, smell, taste, uh, and then what does it do to them inside and how, do they, how does it build that tension internally? Internal tension is probably a really good way to describe it. So um, we're going to end with our the the ten word story that I asked you guys to write ahead of time. I hope you guys had some fun with that. Um, and we're actually going to go in reverse order. Um, so we'll end with Sarah. We'll start with Susan. All right. So I actually did two because okay. I write fantasy and romance. So I'll start with the fantasy. Um, kidnapped paramour Ekaterina returns to King Avalard to avert war. Oh, okay. There's some story there. 
<laughs> well, obviously. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. The romance. Um, patisserie owner Julianne stumbles into her college fling on vacation. We will move right along to the next person, which is Lydia. Well, mine uh, has nothing to do with any kind of writing that I'm doing, but it is pertinent to my life here. That stray orange cat who catches chipmunks is my friend. Satisfied with the result, I listened to the eulogy intently. Oh, dark. Yeah, dark. I know, isn't it fun? <laughs> Let's take a picture. <laughs> yeah, take a picture. You might see it in a, that you might see that in a, in a book. You never know. Um, yeah, these are fun little, fun little exercises. Um, Raven. Okay, I, mine's cute. I had fun with it. Um, I put the bubble gum in Betty's hair. Sorry, mom. (laughs) (laughs) Just, it was (laughs) for fun. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's good. It sounds like, it sounds like, uh, one of your future kids books, maybe. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Sarah, we will end with you. What is your 10 word story? He watched taillights fade into darkness as she drove away. A couple different Sad. things. That could be I know, I'm like, there. come back. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, I just thought that that's the perfect one to end on. Yeah. Because he's driving it is. away. It is. And, yeah. And we come to the end. Very good. Very good. All right. So thank you all for your time today, panelists. It's been wonderful to hear your different perspectives and experiences with writing fiction. Audience, if any of you would like to learn more about these authors uh, or purchase their books, please visit the Deep Valley Book Festival website and click on authors. You will find a directory there of all the authors participating in the book festival this year. Um, Thank you all for joining us today. Please like and share this video with your friends and family. In 15 minutes, uh, Writing the Truth, the nonfiction and memoir writers panel will begin. Enjoy the rest of the fifth annual Deep Valley Book Festival and stay safe and keep on reading. Thank Thank you. Thank you.